the book of Hebrews, chapter number 13. The book of Hebrews is, is a, a stumbling block in the New Testament. People can't properly put it in its right uh, 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 divide, division. Uh, the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrews. And, uh, and somebody said, well, Ephesians was written to Ephesians, but it was written to the church at Ephesus. It don't say anything about Hebrews being written to a church. It was written to Hebrews to whom the oracles of God were committed. There's all kinds of scriptures in Hebrews that are so tribulation flavored you cannot help but see about like an entering into rest, entering into rest, entering into rest. That's right at the end of the tribulation, entering the, the, the millennium. So doctrinally, the book of Hebrews can be a, a, a real stumbling block for people who don't understand it. Every false doctrine in America today People get it from Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews, one of them three books, or not understanding properly how to understand those three books. Tonight, we're not going to talk about doctrine. I'm going to give you a great truth that can hold true for any of us. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5. Let your conversation, you understand, in Bible language, your conversation don't just mean your words, your lifestyle also. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. Is that you? hope so. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I want to preach tonight on the subject, the Lord was there too. What a blessing it is to have this promise. One of the great promises that we have as Christians is that the Lord said he'd always be with us. That's great, y'all. You may sit there and take that for granted. Well, we know that. He'll never leave us. Nor stay. You think about that. You don't ever have to worry about him deserting you. You don't ever have to worry about him changing his mind and saying, I won't fool you no more. He'd be just if he did that, but he don't do it, won't do it, never has done it, never will do it to one of his children. He was there too. Why do you say that, preacher? Because no matter where you are in life or what is going on in your life as a Christian, the Lord's there too. He's with me. He's with you. He was so-and-so over yonder. He was so-and-so over yonder. Uh, have you ever had something happen to you and you think, why in the world, God, is this happening to me? And the Lord don't always have to tell you why. But I'll tell you what he does. He says, I'll tell you one thing. I'm there with you. I'm there with you. Let me just give you a few thoughts this evening. Uh, most of you already know, but I think it'll help somebody in here tonight. And I want to say, first of all, he's there at the time of your salvation. I will never, ever forget the night I got saved. You've heard my testimony over and over and over. I'll not give it all tonight, but I'll tell you one thing. I, my mom taught me there was a God when I was just a little kid. My mom, as you've heard me say, set me and my two sisters on her lap in a big old chair. I was here, my sister's here, my sister's here, and took a big old Bible and read us Bible stories. And she taught us about stories in the Bible. I'll never forget that. So I was four and five and six years old, I knew there was a God. And then my mom sang with, with uh, her sisters. They, they called themselves the Sisters Trio. And they sang uh, uh, like our ladies trio does here and and they sung that three-part harmony, and they'd go to churches. And I remember they'd take me with them when I was just little. I couldn't have been old, five, six years old. And I would just lay in the pew. Pews didn't have padding in them. They are just wood, just solid wood like that. Most of the churches back then. And I remember laying in that seat, you know. And I remember that preacher, he'd get red in the face, and he'd come down there. And I had no idea in the world what he was doing, what he was talking about. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't think bad or good of it. I just, did, I just didn't think about it. And, but mom sang, and they sang, and they sang, and they sang. And them songs stuck in my head. As I grew up, uh, uh, my daddy stayed. We didn't have but one car. And if daddy stayed gone with it all the time, we, we moved to Nebo. We didn't have a way to church. And so my mom would just turn up the... Uh, on the TV on Sunday morning and listen to singing and preaching on TV. That obviously left me and my, my sisters just, we didn't want to listen to it, we'd go outside and play. But all them years, when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, I knew there was a God. And I, could, I knew that he was there. I mean, I, I never had a doubt 
that there was a God up there and he was watching us and we was going to give an account to him one day. I, I remember thinking that. Well, I got 13, you know, and I was about 12 years old and started playing music and I got a guitar and started playing music and we got in a band. I got in a band with some older boys. That was a big mistake because I was 13 years old. They were 17, 18, and uh, that was when we went down there to Charlotte and, and made that record. One, two of our guys wrote, wrote them songs. Uh, 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 wrong Ticket was one of them, Happy was another one, something like that. And uh, we played them little old songs, and we'd play for dances up at the Lake Club and dances in our high school. At Nebo School, they'd have dances, and we got to play. And uh, our band would play, you know, and I remember people holding their ears back when everybody hated rock and roll, and if I'd have had any sense, I'd have hated it too, but I didn't have no sense. And uh, I, 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 uh, uh, people got mad about it, and we, we, we played, and we played, and when I was when I was uh, about that time, I started liking basketball so much that I, that's all I wanted to do is play basketball. I would wad up. We didn't get to play uh, back then like kids do now. I don't. We didn't get to play in a gym to use in the ninth grade. Not, playing in a gym was unheard of. Now they're that high uh, and, and, and playing. But uh, back then, we played outside on the dirt, on the dirt court. And uh, when it got dark, we, I mulled up a ball of socks about that big, put the trash can in the corner, and I'd shoot up them socks in that trash can. And I'd do spin moves, and I'd dunk it on the trash can and fall and steal the ball and everything. I had a home game going in my head at 12, 13, uh, 14. And little by little, I started uh, playing basketball all the time, and you've heard my testimony. Uh, I was at, uh, in the ninth grade, I was, uh, I was 14. I was only 16 in the 12th grade. I turned 17 my senior year in November, which meant uh, August, September, October, and November. I was 16 in the 12th grade. Didn't, and uh, so, because Daddy snuck me in a year early. And we, we, uh, we uh, had, was playing all the time then, and I was about 15, and I was in the gym at basketball practice, and the big boys come in. They had their girlfriends with them. They was smoking pot and stuff. I wasn't doing nothing like that. And they came in. They said, Danny, hey, we got band practice. We got band practice. And I looked at Coach Laney. And he said, you got to make up your mind, boy. You're going to play ball or play, play music. I said, see y'all. And they left and I quit the band. And the Lord used that to keep me out of a lot of trouble. Because I was so young, I would have probably went down the wrong road. I don't know whatever happened to them guys. I don't know if they're still alive dead and in hell or what, I don't know. Uh, but I, I saw our drummer not long ago in the, in, the, in the grocery store, the drummer, he said, hey, Danny, he said, uh, why don't we get the band back together? And I said, yeah, right. I, I said, yeah, let's do that. I said, uh, uh, what are you going to play? Love lights away from me? I said, no, can't do it, can't do it. I went the other way, boy. I mean, what would y'all think about me if I got the band back together? And, you know, we was up there singing Hang On Sloopy, you know, or, or something, something like that. Wouldn't that be crazy? I'm ashamed of you, Pastor. I mean, man, he's so drunk, running around with his shirt tail out on Sunday morning. I don't want to hear another word about that. Uh, but I, 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 we started playing. But anyway, uh, when I got 17, I, well, I graduated high school at 17 and then turned 18 and they had the big revival up there at Nebo Baptist Church. And I'm telling you that night, ladies and gentlemen, I went to church. Lord have mercy. I had no idea. I had no idea. I went down scared. I got up secured. I went down a sinner. I got up a saint. I went down lost and I got up saved, brother. I went down hell bound, got up heaven bound. I, got, uh, I went down, brother, with no purpose and I got up with a chart for living and dying in eternity like nothing in this world could ever say. I went down, the, the, I went to fight, but oh my, that night, God got a hold of me. That was the greatest thing that ever happened to me, bar none. Nothing can even take the place, even come close to be saved by the wonderful grace of God. We won the, the district championship, uh, the county championship, district championship. Went to the state playoffs in Raleigh. I got the most valuable player trophy. I, I, well, our team averaged 84 points a game with four 
little short quarters and no three-point line. And I thought, man, this is great. We had this, but it wasn't nothing. When I got saved, it wasn't nothing, nothing. All the things of the world could not compare. I'm telling you, the Lord was there the night I got saved. And he was there when you got saved. He was there. He was there. Hallelujah. They ain't never been nobody come and called on him, and he wasn't there. He was there too. He was there too. He was there when you got saved. It might not have been that dramatic for you, especially if you got saved when you was little, five, six, seven years old. I mean, everything, I mean, obviously, uh, it's not a big a change. That night I went home. I laid down. I had a motorcycle. I rode a motorcycle to work the next day. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd trade him up for this old boy. And, and uh, uh, I went in the next day and got fired. Got fired from my job the next day. This boy that I worked with, he was selling pot, and I wouldn't touch it. I didn't touch it, never touched it, never did. And I said, nope, don't want nothing to do with it. And I went in the next day, me and him was sitting down, and the plant manager comes, so I was sitting down. We worked on a trash truck. That was my job. I worked loading trash. I mean, weather like this, we get out there at 18 degrees in the morning, and we'd load trash, and the only reason they wanted me over there is to play ball for them. I played ball for their team, and they said, now, Danny, you can't quit. You can't quit. You can't quit. And I, and I quit playing ball. <laughs> quit playing ball for seven years uh, to get my feet on the ground spiritually. And, brother, I'm telling you, God done a work in my heart. Oh, my Lord. Lord I, I have never, ever, ever, ever since seen or done or been a part of anything like it. I'm telling you, when they interview people on the, in the world and they come up and say, this is the greatest day of my life, I think they must not be saved. Uh, when somebody gets a Grammy or an Emmy and they say, this is the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to me, I think you must not be saved. Listen, brother, there ain't nothing like being saved. Nothing can compare. You're missing hell, man. You're not going to burn in hell, people, and you're going to heaven forever and ever. He was there. When I got saved, number two, he was there in a time of sorrow and suffering. I didn't know that I'd have to suffer and have sorrow when I got saved, but I did. And I've not had a lot. God's been good to me. I have had my heart broke a few times, and a heartbreak is the worst hurt in the world. I, I'm going to get your heart broke. There ain't no medicine for it. And uh, uh, I've, I've suffered a little bit. God's been good to me. I've not had to go through a lot of physical agony like a lot of people have, but I have went through some very hard battles and some, some tough trials, and I'm telling you the Lord was there too. He was there too. He didn't quit me after I got saved and say, well, I'll see you in heaven, Danny. I, when I went through my hard times, he was there. I told you about when my dad passed away, and that morning, it was on New Year's, it would have been like this past Sunday. No, Sunday before last, the Sunday after Christmas is when it was. And we was getting ready to have a New Year's service like the next day or two. And that Sunday morning, I preached a sermon, a part one of how to start the New Year. And I got up and announced that morning, I said, I'll be back tonight and preach the second half of this sermon. Everybody be here. And I mean, there's a crowd of people there. And I went home, found that my dad had passed away. Dad fell dead in the heart with a heart attack in the bedroom floor. Well, obviously, I started bawling. I cried my eyes out. I cried. And you know, when you cry like that, you get a real bad headache. And my nose stopped up. And my head was just a busting. I remember it was busting. And I, I tried to lay down. It was 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Ken, people was coming in the house. People was coming out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I went upstairs in my bed. Uh, my bed still today. And I laid down there and I thought, God, God. God, and I went down, some of kin folk had come over there, and they was bringing in food, and I started getting dressed. They said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting ready to go to church. We got church. And my kin folks in there, so you can't, Danny, they don't expect you to be there. I said, I'm not going because they expect me. I told them, people, I'd come back tonight and preach the second half of that sermon. And, and uh, Mom said, son, you don't have to do that. And I said, I told them I would, and I'm going to do it. And I went back that night, and I stood up, and I tried to preach. And my daddy, I'd been dead just a few hours. And I sat up there that night, and it was like somebody was holding me up. I, I felt him around me. He was there too, y'all. He wasn't just there that night I got saved. I went to the funeral home. I, I preached my daddy's funeral and my sister's and my mother's. And I stood there. He was there too at my sister's funeral. He was there too at my mama's funeral. I can tell you, the Lord was there too. I don't care what you go through. He'll be there too. Don't ever think, this is too bad. The Lord's left me. Don't, don't go by your feelings. He'll be there too. Amen. Number three, 
He'll be there in a time of persecution. He was there in a time of persecution. I've been persecuted a little bit. I've, they, we've, I've, we got in a big fight in Marion one time over alcohol all my life. McDowell County was a dry county. If you, went, if you wanted to buy beer, you, had, you bought it from a bootlegger or come to Morganton. And I, I still think that's the way it should be. I think bootleggers should sell alcohol if anybody does. And just like, just like marijuana, Boot, let bootleggers do it. If, and I'm not for either one, but if one's legal, what's the difference in the other one? And I'm not, don't you take that wrong. Don't you twist what I just said. They both ought to be in hell where they belong. And I'm going to tell you, uh, we had a big fight up there, and I preached a sermon called The Double Curse of Booze. And one of the ladies uh, done that for you. She typed it out, run a whole page in the McDowell News. I'm telling you, Lord, at the fur hit the fan. Uh, you remember that, Miss Miller? Y'all remember that? It was back in the mid-'80s. You, do you remember it, Kay? Oh, my goodness. They called me every third in the book. They called me bad names. They wrote articles against me. They put, one of the teachers at the high school said, well, your preacher don't know what he's talking about. And he said, well, the preacher said this, that, and showed him scripture. Well, he don't know what he's talking about. And they got mad, and the, and the, 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 the uh, big shots in town got mad because uh, we took a car, we took an old wrecked car, where four boys had been killed in it because of alcohol and had them pull it uptown on Main Street. And we put it there where this doctor let us put it on his, put it on Main Street and put up a one that I rented one of them big signs. It lights up. Remember when everybody used to have them big sign that had an arrow on top of it and flashing lights? And it said, A boat for alcohol is a boat to kill. Oh, Lord, brother. I mean, they come out of the woodwork. They cuss me. They call me everything. And I was up in Michigan preaching revival. And they, somebody called me and they said, Brother Danny, they said that the law has come and said we got to move that. that move that uh, and some crooked lawyer in Marion had dug into the files and they said that, it, it, that you could not have a junkyard on Main Street in Marion. <laughs> I said, a junkyard? I said, Lord, there's cars parked out there. It looks as bad as that one. Some in our parking lot. And they made us move that car, and we put it over there in the church parking lot and put that sign on our own land. There wasn't nothing to do about it. And, buddy, the, I was in a restaurant up there one day, and this guy looked over and he said, yeah, these preachers, thank God, blah, blah, blah. They cussed me. Somebody cut my brake lines. Uh, I didn't have no brakes on my car in a brand-new Toyota Camry. And, brother, I, uh, pretty new. And and uh, I bought it from Johnny's daddy, the old Toyota Camry. And uh, I was going down the driveway and didn't have no brakes. And I took my mom to visit my sister dying with cancer up in the mountain. And I come down the mountain and didn't have no brakes. And I didn't tell mom she had died with three heart attacks. And I, I kept getting faster and faster. She said, and I got down to the bottom and I pulled off. So I said, Mom, we ain't got no brakes. She said, what? And we was already down the mountain then. And I pulled off there. And I said, Mom, something wrong with my brakes. And I took it to a mechanic and left it there with him. I said, a brand new Toyota with a few miles on it shouldn't have a brake problem. He said, uh, if somebody don't like you, maybe, I don't know. And he said, somebody's took your brake line loose, preacher. I said, you're kidding me. They come up in our yard and did it at night. He said, that's right. Somebody's trying to get you killed. And I said, you know what? Uh, uh, but the Lord was there too. The Lord was there too. I can tell you about threats. A guy called me up one night. He said, I'm going to come over and burn your house down. I said, you are not. I thought, well, I hope you are. He said, yes, I am. I said, no, you're not. I thought, oh, Lord, don't let him. I stayed up half a night that night where he's going to burn. He didn't. Uh, he finally got killed, hit by a car, killed him. Uh, listen, there's a lady come in one time. That's true. I didn't, and, I, I, and I tried to help that boy. I tried to help him. Y'all remember that time this woman came in? This woman came in up there one Sunday night. There was hundreds and hundreds of people sitting in there on Sunday night. She got over here and got the microphone. And some, she said, you blankety blank, bunch of the blank, that blank, 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 cussing everybody. Everybody just sat there. And I was out in the hall. Somebody ran out there and said, Brother Daddy, get in here, get in here. And by the time I got in, she quit and spit on the piano. And, uh, and she turned around and walked out. I told Sam, and I said, look, if somebody does that, I can cut the microphone off. Yeah. Duh. Punch that button, Dylan, if anybody ever starts doing that here. Uh, and and I, didn't, I wasn't in there, and that woman got killed by a train right up the street in the church about two or three weeks later. 
run over. Uh, it was awful. It was awful. And you know what? I'm not happy about that. I, that breaks my heart uh, because you know what? The Lord was there too. Then one time somebody called me and they said, this woman's demon possessed and they want you to, they want you to cast it out. I was like, well, I'll try. <laughs> I ain't going to make no promises. I ain't going to cast out a demon. I can try it. I, reckon that other, I can do an exorcism or whatever. And this weird preacher was from the other side of town. He, and he brought this demon-possessed woman in. And she come in there, and they, and it was, you know, we didn't have all the lights on. It was about halfway dark. You know, a church is the scariest place in the world when it's dark. Have you ever been to a church by yourself when it's dark? Oh, my goodness. It's like, like I don't know, man. It gives you the creeps. And, and we went in there, and just half the lights was on. And we stood, I stood here, that weird preacher stood here, and that demon-possessed woman stood here. And they, he said, now, Reverend, uh, would you pray for her? I honestly didn't know which one I was scared of most. I mean, I thought, well, he might be demon possessed. And I said, dear Lord. <laughs> the Bible says watch him pray. That's what I did. I kept one eye. I said, if he makes one move toward me, I'm going to kick him on his and run out the door. <laughs> I was scared. I said, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, I can tell you stuff. I can tell you stuff that you would not believe. I'll, I'll tell him about Susan one of these days. That takes a long time. Lord, have mercy. The crazy woman had chased me around for about two or three years. It was awful. It was awful. Awful. Unbelievable. She had to cop up and uptown, and, and we thought she'd come and was hid in her house and everything else. And It was awful. Crazy. She went over, this woman went over to McDowell Tech in college and stood up and said, me and Danny Castle got married over the holidays. Told the whole class that. She, I mean, just, she was nuts. And somebody told me, I said, What? I said, she's crazy. Don't pay no attention to her. And I can tell you a whole bunch of stuff. You know what? The Lord was there too. The Lord was there too. There ain't no way I could have made all the miles I've traveled. I've wore out I don't know how many cars, drove millions of miles, and the Lord was there too. Can I help you tonight? He's with you whatever you're going through. He was there in persecution. He was there in time of decisions. You know the best way to make your decisions, especially young people? In the light of and according to the Word of God. You'll be glad if you make your decisions based upon the Scriptures. Not on your feeling or the desires of your flesh. Uh, you'll regret it in your relationships. If you, if you, uh, I, 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 let me tell you a story. The story of Francis and Edith Schaefer. They were missionaries overseas right after World War II. And they attracted tons of college students. Their ministry was getting college students together on the weekends and answering life's tough questions. Like where'd we come from? Philosophical questions and stuff like that. And let me tell you how they met. Remember this, young people. Francis the, the man, that's a weird name for a man, but that's his name. Uh, uh, Francis grew up in Philadelphia, had no religious affiliation. His parents hardly, seldom ever went to church, no Christian background whatsoever. But he was educated and he was teaching English to a Russian immigrant in his house trying to teach this man English. He sent him to buy some books and he went to the bookstore to buy some books and the person in the bookstore put the wrong book in his package and he wound up with, with, a, with a book on German philosophy. You know, old Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates, them guys. And uh, he, he come in and he, uh, he, he uh, uh, put, got that book and he started reading it and studying it and it made him realize that the Greek philosophers had no answer for the great questions of life. Where did we come from? What are we doing here? Where are we going? What's the future? Do we just live and die and that's the end of us? What put us here? How did we get here? They had no answer. So he studied and studied and studied. Had no idea, but a young lady, Edith, was training herself to do that. 
And they went, she went to a church one Sunday night, June 26, 1932, went to a Presbyterian church and a Unitarian preacher got up and started denying the Bible and denied the deity of Christ and said everything against what the Bible says. He was a total liberal unbeliever. And she was sitting there preparing her notes. I'm going to say this. I'm going to say that. I'm going to stand up to this guy. When he got through, Francis Schaeffer, who had been studying this stuff, stood up and said, can I say something? And he stood up and shredded that Unitarian preacher's arguments and tore it apart bit by bit, proving that there had to be a God and there's a reason for us being here. And she was sitting there like, wow, somebody else believes like I do? And so when he got through, she stood up and said her piece. And when they got to get after church and never was separated again. They talked, they talked, then they fell in love, then they got married, and they used their life as a ministry. That's a good way to make decisions. Usually, a relationship that don't start right don't usually go right. Not always. God can have mercy. God can bless it. God can turn things around. Don't get me wrong. But a relationship that don't start right usually don't go right. And that's the way they started. Brother, it went and they had a great relationship. He was with them in life's big decisions. You ought to pray about where, where to live. You ought to pray about a house to live in. You ought to pray about a job. Listen, I pray about a car. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I got... Kelly won for Christmas and I prayed about that and I prayed about that and I called people and Jude and, and argued and everything else on the phone and I bickered back and forth with them and, and I didn't just go and buy the first car. I said, you don't do that. I pray, Lord, what's your will to be done? Uh, he'll, he'll be with you in life's decisions if you'll let him. I said, uh, Archibald Gracie was on a big cruise ship one night Long time ago, and they had a six foot tank with heated salt water in it. And he went swimming in it, and it relaxed his muscles, that hot salt water, therapeutic for his body and all. Said it's the best bath he ever felt in his life. Little did he know that the ship he was on, the Titanic, he'd be taking another dip in just a few hours. April 14th, 1912. He went to his cabin and went to sleep. And all of a sudden, bam, he felt that thing hit and he woke up and ran upstairs and was told we've hit an iceberg and the ship's going down. And they found out later, back in New York, his wife woke up and felt a heavy, heavy burden to pray. This is a true story. She said, I don't know what's wrong. You know, they didn't have cell phones, communicate, no TV or nothing. And she said, she got down on beside her bed and opened up her, uh, she had a prayer book, and she opened up his prayer book, and it was a prayer for those at sea, just by sheer accident, she thought. And she read that prayer for those at sea and said, God, please take care of him. God, I don't know what's going on. But the Lord, please take it. Meanwhile, the ship was going down. People was screaming. Lifeboats getting out here and going there. And he said he went down with the ship. And he said he went down with the ship. And he said he thought across his mind. He had heard all these stories about when ships go down, sometimes in boilers. You remember them big boilers? Big things stack, like a big smokestack sticked up. Sometimes they would explode and they would heat the water up so, so much. It, it scald you to death. And he said all he could think about one of them boilers is going to blow up, and I'm going to get I'm going to get boiled out here. But the water is like I don't know, it's like almost freezing, real cold. And he said he took off swimming with all of his might, and he said he made up his mind he wasn't going to let none of that salt water get in his mouth. And he just kept and he said he just kept swimming and kept swimming and kept swimming and kept swimming. Back home, his wife was saying, "Oh God, please, God, please, I don't know what's wrong. God, please, I don't know what's wrong." God, I don't know what's wrong. Please take care of him. And he said he swam and he swam and he swam and he went under and he come back. And he said when he come up, there wasn't no Titanic. She said that thing was gone and the sea was calm. And he said there was like a mist about so many feet above the water, like a like fog. He said it was the weirdest looking sight. 
and he could hear screams of over a thousand people screaming. He said, you never heard such a terrible sound in your life. And he looked, and over there was a lifeboat turned upside down and about 12 men on top of it. With one of them capsized, and, and they got on top of it. He swam, 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 swam. And he said, there's a guy on there, and he grabbed that guy's arm. And he said, that guy, they didn't even try to help him. Nobody said, come on, because they thought, you know, one more, and this thing's liable to go under. So they said, heck with you, man. And he grabbed a hold of somebody and held on and pulled himself up on that lifeboat. Five o'clock that morning, the rescue workers came and picked them up. Five that morning, she said she, the burden lifted, and she got peace in her heart and turned the light out and went to sleep. He was there. The Lord was there in those dark, dark times. I don't know who it is here tonight. The devil is trying to tell you, the Lord, don't, he ain't even with you. He's tired of fooling with you. You've messed up too much. You've made a mess. God... I'm telling you, he's there. He said, I will never. You say, Brother Danny, you don't know. He's there too. Brother Danny, I'm going through this. He's there too. The Lord's there too. Could we stand please and bow our heads, every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody's moving. Miss Desi's coming to the piano tonight. Young person, teenager, boy, girl, mom, dad, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how bad your life's messed up, but I promise you this, he's there. He's there with you, just like he was with that guy going down on the Titanic. She's playing softly. Who is it here tonight? Maybe marriage. Maybe finances. 